Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Jamie Mitchell. I am an endocrine surgeon and um, the uh, medical director at the Norman Parathyroid Center, as well as the director of uh, the Division of Parathyroid Surgery here at our uh, Hospital for Endocrine Surgery in Tampa, Florida, which you can see shown behind me here. Um, one thing that I've noticed uh, in my career is that there's a lot of confusion about parathyroids in general and parathyroid disease. Most people will have never heard of parathyroid glands. Um, a lot of doctors don't really know much about parathyroid disease and how to treat it. And so, you know, we decided to do some of these Facebook Live events um, for people who have found themselves uh, faced with a parathyroid problem and don't really know much about it or what to do. And hopefully this can help uh, some of those people out there. Um, just a quick uh, history uh, in terms of uh, my education and training. Um, my undergrad studies were done at a Jesuit school, a uh, small one in Massachusetts called Holy Cross. Um, my medical school training was done at Georgetown University, and then I did my general surgery residency training at one of the Harvard uh, training programs in Boston. Uh, I then did fellowship training in endocrine surgery at the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland. Uh, I was a, uh, an academic surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic for some years before I joined the Norman Parathyroid Center, and I've been here for about 10 years now. Um, how are we doing with, uh, we're good, okay. Just wanted to make sure people had, uh, had joined before we started going through some of these questions. So, we received a number of questions over the last few weeks, I'm going to go through those now. Um, uh, just a quick comment, some of the, of the questions that came in were very specific to particular patients in their situation, and it's not a great forum here to go through those. Um, but I encourage you, um, if you were one of those people who submitted those specific questions, um, to go to our website and consider doing an intake um, at form.parathyroid.com. Uh, if you do that, then either myself or one of my partners will call you personally and review your case and, and talk it out with you, okay? Um, so let's start with the questions. Question number one we received, if you have one parathyroid gland removed, can one of the remaining glands develop another adenoma and cause hyperparathyroidism again? Uh, the answer is yes, that can occur, although it's pretty rare, um, to be honest. But do we see it? Um, yeah, we do. Patients will come back 10 or 15 years later after having a successful operation and have developed recurrence. Uh, more commonly, to be honest, uh, the reason pa patients um, need to deal with this again is typically because they didn't get the right operation the first time. You know, most surgeons in this country uh, perform a more focal parathyroid operation uh, directed by imaging study results. And if you don't evaluate all of the parathyroid glands during the operation, which is what we do, um, it's not that uncommon to miss an abnormal gland. It's pretty common about 30% of the time that patients have more than one abnormal gland. Uh, imaging tests often don't show this. Um, the intraoperative PTH value that, um, that most surgeons use when they do focal parathyroid surgery can be misleading. This has been shown clearly, including by a study that uh, my group in Cleveland did. And so unless you evaluate all the glands during the operation, um, you're going to miss abnormal glands, and that's usually why people recur within a few years. But even if you get a good operation, some people are pretty unlucky, and they do develop another tumor down the line. Uh, next question. Um, what is PTHRP, uh, and does it relate to parathyroid disease? Uh, it's a good question. What PTHRP stands for PTH-related peptide. Uh, this is a, a protein, uh, a peptide hormone that uh, is very similar to parathyroid hormone, although it's not the same hormone. It has some normal functions in our body, actually, but the reason that endocrinologists will check for this uh, when, when you present to them with hypercalcemia, for example, is because uh, certain cancers can secrete this hormone, and it can cause hypercalcemia as part of what's called the perineoplastic process. And so they're usually checking it to make sure that the hypercalcemia is not from malignancy. Um, to be honest, uh, it's pretty unusual. This is a rare uh, thing to happen, and it's, it's usually um, a better course of action to simply check a regular PTH first, because if it's elevated, um, then you know that this is from, from primary hyperparathyroidism. 
Um, if, for example, you, you have a high calcium and your doctor checks your PTH and it's really low, like 5 or, or suppressed, then checking a PTH RP is reasonable to, to try to figure out where the hypercalcemia is coming from. Uh, but for most, for most people, it's not that important in the evaluation of hyperthyroidism. Okay, next question. Um, I have high PTH but normal calcium levels. I have all the symptoms of hyperparathyroidism. Is it possible to have parathyroid disease with normal calcium levels? Uh, the answer is yes. Um, it is well described that there is um, uh, a, a phenotype of hyperparathyroidism called normal calcemic primary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, it's much less common and it's more difficult to diagnose and it's really important to make sure that you do not have secondary PTH elevation. What do I mean by that? Um, there are certain situations that can cause uh, hypersecretion or oversecretion of parathyroid hormone that do not relate to diseased parathyroid glands. The parathyroid glands are normal, they're doing their job, they're just working harder than usual because of an outside influence. And there's several common things that can do this. Uh, one is advanced kidney disease or, or end-stage renal failure. Um, all patients with, with dialysis-dependent renal failure develop secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, people have had a gastric bypass, uh, which causes a malabsorption problem for calcium and vitamin D causes this. There's something called the renal calcium leak syndrome that can cause uh, this pattern of biochemistry. None of these things benefit from surgery in general. Um, some cases of renal disease can benefit from surgery, but in, in most cases of secondary hyperparathyroidism, the treatment is medical. Supplementation of calcium and vitamin D, etc. And so it's important for your doctor to make sure that, that when you have normal calcium levels and high PTH, that it's not a secondary problem. Next question. Um, let's see. What do we have? Is it possible to have hyperparathyroidism with high calcium levels but normal PTH levels? That's like the opposite of the question we just did. And the answer is yes. Um, probably 20% of patients who have primary hyperparathyroidism uh, have high calcium and their PTH values uh, measure within the, you know, within the normal range. Uh, the important concept here is that if you think about what parathyroids do, all that they do, their only job is to raise your calcium back to normal when it's too low in your bloodstream. And so if your calcium is elevated um, for any reason other than uh, hyperparathyroidism, your pH should be really, it should be really low, it should be suppressed because there's no reason to make that hormone um, if your calcium is elevated. However, if you look at your labs and you have elevated calcium levels and your PTH is, say, 50, which is within the normal range, but not suppressed, that's inappropriately normal. To, that, that's the concept. The, that PTH level is too high for an elevated calcium level, and that's consistent with diagnostic of having primary hyperparathyroidism. So it's a common thing that we see doctors uh, make a mistake with, where they'll notice a high calcium level They'll, uh, if they're a student, enough, check a PTH value, but they'll see that it measures 40 or 50, which is in the normal range, and they will conclude that the patient doesn't have a problem. That's not the case. So just keep that in mind, okay? It's a good question. All right, next question. Can hyperparathyroidism be genetic? Should any type of testing be done? In most cases, no, but yes, there are, there are hereditary forms of hyperparathyroidism. Um, they're quite rare, but the most common of these are called the multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes. There's type 1 and type 2. Uh, these involve a constellation of neuroendocrine tumors, uh, including hyperparathyroidism. It's an autosomal dominant uh, mutation, which means if your parents have it, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. And if you have it, your kids have a 50-50 chance of getting it. Um, we don't really consider familial types of parathyroid disease unless there are three first-degree family members who have hyperparathyroidism. So that means siblings or parent-child relationships. And so um, there aren't really any guidelines for genetic testing unless you find yourself in that situation where you have two siblings or a parent and a sibling who all have hyperparathyroidism. Then it's reasonable to consider it 
And the genetic testing is not difficult. It's, it's simply a blood test that your doctor or your endocrinologist or whoever can arrange for you. Okay, here's um, a question. I have had two failed parathyroid surgeries to locate and remove the gland causing my hyperparathyroidism. My PTH and calcium levels remain high. My endocrinologist wants to continue with monitoring. Any suggestions on what I should do? Um, this is a, a situation that you know a lot of patients find themselves in, and it's become one of my areas of, of, of really uh, of, of special interest. Um, reoperative parathyroid surgery is, is a much more difficult uh, endeavor for a number of reasons. And uh, in my experience, I've found that there are a lot of patients out there who've had unsuccessful surgeries for one reason or another, in this case, two unsuccessful surgeries, and they're sort of left with no options, not knowing what to do um, with, with suggestions like, let's just, we'll, let's just look at it. Um, I would recommend, if you can, um, uh, going to the website and doing an intake form. I would love to evaluate your case. Um, in most cases, I can find a solution to your problem, probably 95% of the time. Um, but it's worth an evaluation because um, uh, I've had many patients who have been told there's nothing that can be done for you, and it's just not the case in most instances. Um, and for anyone who finds themselves in that situation, because of my interest, I've been doing some uh, YouTube videos which have described uh, various reoperative cases that I've been involved in, kind of what had been done before, what I did, and kind of how we solved their problem. Um, if you go to, the, to our website at parathyroid.com, you can find these videos and it may be helpful to look through some of them just to see what other situations patients have found themselves in might be similar to yours. Um, and the fact that there are uh, usually solutions um, to your problem. Okay, what's next? How have you seen GFR values and kidney function change after parathyroidectomy after long-term undiagnosed hyperparathyroidism? Uh, it's a good question. Um, the reason that we advocate treating hyperparathyroidism when it is diagnosed is because of the, uh, the various end organ damage complications that it causes. Uh, damage to the kidneys and reduction of GFR, renal failure, renal, renal insufficiency is one of those things. In addition to uh, damage to the coronary and cerebral vessels, increasing risk for stroke and heart attack, etc. But damage to the kidneys is one of the primary ones. The reason we advocate for treating this disease when it's diagnosed and not waiting is because um, the only data that I have seen for improvement in that damage is, is to the skeleton. The accelerated bone loss that parathyroid disease causes can be reversed, and in most patients they, they show an improvement in their bone density following successful treatment, successful surgery. But damage to the cerebral vessels, the coronary vessels, and the kidneys there really isn't good data that shows that that damage reverses. You're sort of stuck with it. Uh, that's why it's important not to wait uh, till you have that damage. It's important to treat this disease when it's diagnosed uh, to prevent those, those, uh, that damage from occurring. Next question. Uh, the question is, can hyperparathyroidism cause osteoarthritis? Um, Degenerative changes to the joints, uh, which is really what we're talking about when we say osteoarthritis, uh, not specifically. Um, however, hyperparathyroidism commonly causes um, bone and joint pain, discomfort, etc. That's a very common symptom to have. And what I see frequently is patients with this disease will complain of, of pain in various parts of the skeleton or joints, and the doctor will x-ray them. And most people with this disease are in their 50s or older, and uh, after 50 years <laughs> finding gravity on this planet, if you x-ray your joints, there will be degenerative changes. And so it's very easy to say, yeah, your pain in your hip or your knee is from, you know, is from osteoarthritis, and maybe, maybe that's the case. Um, but it's pretty common to have pain in these joints from this disease, and it goes away instantly when it's treated. So it's something to keep in mind. There's hope. Uh, for improvement in some of that pain that you have in your joints if you have this disease and you get it treated successfully. Okay, uh, some other questions have come in while we're here. Let's see. 
This is a great one. My blood work shows hyperparathyroidism, but multiple scans have not shown any adenomas. What should I do? Um, imaging tests should play no uh, role in diagnosing this disease or deciding to treat it. Uh, the reason is that imaging technology for, you know, for seeing abnormal parathyroid glands, for imaging them, simply isn't very good. The sensitivity is poor. It's maybe 50 to 60 percent which means that half the people out there with hyperparathyroidism have imaging tests that don't show anything. Um, we know that you have the disease because these are neuroendocrine tumors that change your biochemistry in a very specific way. So your lab data tells us that you have a tumor whether we can see it on an imaging test or not. Not seeing it on imaging should not affect the decision to treat this. Um, and in our practice, the results of imaging tests don't play any role in most cases in the operation that we do, which is always to identify and evaluate all four of your parathyroid glands. If you use imaging tests to tell you what to do during a parathyroid operation, and many surgeons in this country do do that, you're going to be wrong a lot of the time. Um, and it's going to lead to some of these patients out there who have had unsuccessful surgeries. So if your surgeon is telling you there's nothing we can do because your scans are negative, or your doctor says, yeah, it looked like you have hyperparathyroidism, but your scan was negative, you're fine, that's not correct. Um, you still have the problem, it's all based on your biochemistry, that's the diagnosis. And you should still proceed with surgery. Just find a surgeon who is comfortable operating without imaging tests help, um, like our group, for example. Uh, okay, what's next? Let's see, um, here's a good one, that's a common question. Are you able to tell how long the adenomas have been there when you operate? Um, you know, not really is the short answer, although um, there are certain changes we see with parathyroid adenomas uh, where you can tell the disease is fairly long term. What I mean by that is the following. Um, the size of the tumor, things of that nature, don't, are not really predictive because the growth rate can be fairly variable. But when people have had parathyroid tumors for a long time, they, they can look a little different. Uh, most parathyroid adenomas separate very easily from the surrounding tissues. But older ones can get pretty stuck. They get adherent, and when that's the case, when that's what we find, we know that the tumor's pretty old. You know, 10 years or more, for example. And the color can get a little different. They can get a whitish hue to them when they're, when they're quite old. Um, other than that, which is a fairly imprecise measure of, of, of length of time, obviously, it's hard to tell how long someone's had disease just by looking at the tumor itself. It's really based on how long their bowel chemistry has been abnormal. But it's a good question, a common one. Um, let's see. How is the second surgery protocol different if primary hyperparathyroidism is suspected again after a successful surgery? Um, for our group, uh, the main difference is the following. Uh, as I just talked about when discussing the question about imaging tests being negative, uh, for, for first-time operations, uh, for our group, uh, the way we do this, uh, imaging results being positive or negative doesn't have any bearing on the operation that we do. Um, we do a foregland identification, evaluation, and that's how we decide where the disease is and what needs to come out. Uh, for a second neck operation, it's a little bit different. Um, depending on how long it has been, we can tend to want, uh, or, or the, the, tend, uh, the trend is towards being a bit more focal in the surgery. The reason for that is because reoperating in any part of the body, including the neck, it's, it's more difficult. Uh, technically, it's more difficult for the following reasons. When you operate on any part of the body, really what we're doing is a controlled injury to your tissues. And part of being a surgeon and learning how to operate is learning what the tissues look like, what they feel like, how they move in relationship to each other, etc. That's how you learn how to you know, safely navigate through the, the different tissues and different parts of the body as a surgeon. When you operate in any part of the body, that controlled injury results in inflammatory changes, healing has to occur, etc. And the consequence of that is the tissues change, they look different, they feel different, they move differently, and it's, it's harder because of that to navigate through those tissues a second time. 
when we're talking about parathyroid surgery and pretty small things that we're trying to either identify or keep safe, you know, that makes it more difficult and therefore sometimes we want to be a bit more, we want to do a little bit less surgery. Um, we can sometimes be more image guided in those circumstances, although not always, it depends on a number of things. How long it's been, how much surgery was done the first time, etc. Et um, but that's a good question. The approach can be a bit different for reoperative surgeries. Um, have you ever operated on someone with high PTH and calcium levels where it turned out the patient did not have an adenoma? Um, how, how do I answer this? Um, there are certain circumstances, it's pretty unusual for this group, but there are times that we operate on patients and don't find a parathyroid adenoma. Um, is it because the diagnosis was wrong? Not, not usually. Um, if your calcium and pH are clearly elevated, then you know you have a parathyroid tumor. Um, but part of the challenge of parathyroid surgery is the anatomy and embryology of these glands, and uh, basically they're not always in the same place. You know, they they perform a migration during embryology to where they finally end up in the neck, and that migration doesn't always go according to plan. So there's variability where these glands can be. Usually it's variability within the neck where we can still find them, but there are, there are times when parathyroids are not in the neck or they're in a much different part of the neck such that a normal approach just can't really get to those areas. Uh, if you have that circumstance and you have an imaging test that doesn't show that gland, um, in some cases there's just no way to get to those places. In a lot of cases, even if you have an ectopic location of a parathyroid tumor, we can still find them. Uh, but there are some places you just can't get to. And so those are the cases really where we, um, where we don't find an adenoma. It's not because we don't think the patient has the disease. It's just an unusual anatomic situation. There are also times we operate on patients where we find four normal parathyroid glands, and it's, it doesn't mean the patient doesn't have the disease. Again, unusual circumstances can occur with the anatomy of these glands, and some people have more than four parathyroid glands. And so we find that they have four normal glands in typical spots, and they have an adenoma in an unusual spot um, that sometimes we can find, sometimes we have to do some more work to figure out where it is. So in general, if your PTH and calcium are high, you have this disease. Um, if a parathyroid tumor is not found, um, in my experience with other surgeons, when patients come to me for a second operation, it's usually in a typical location. It was just missed due to an experience, that sort of thing. If we don't find a tumor, it's usually because it's in, tip, uh, it's in an unusual location. And that's, as I said before, it's a rare problem for us. Uh, what is the most amount or number of parathyroidness you have seen in a patient? Um, that's a good question. Uh, personally, I've seen a patient with seven parathyroid glands. Um, now, there's a certain percentage, as I just mentioned, of uh, patients in, this, in our population who have more than four glands. Um, the situation that we see where most commonly people have extra glands is in patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes. I mentioned that earlier in the, uh, in the, 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 the broadcast. Uh, another question about genetic versions of parathyroid disease. Patients with multiple endocrine neoplasia syndromes tend to have uh, a higher incidence of, of supernumerary glands or extra parathyroid glands. And the most that I ever saw uh, was, was seven. You know, it's an interesting question. Uh, do bone spurs typically go away after surgery? Um, yeah, if you have bone, it's, the question number one is, are your bone spurs related to your parathyroid disease? And, you know, that's, that's a difficult question to answer. Um, but bone spurs don't usually evaporate or go away with a successful parathyroid surgery, to be honest. Um, if they've developed from hypercalcemia or calcium deposits, etc., from the disease, they don't sort of evaporate. It's similar with kidney stones. If you develop kidney stones from hyperparathyroidism and we cure, cure the disease, they don't just evaporate because we fixed the hyperparathyroidism. If they've formed already, you know, they're there. Uh, it's, it's the same sort of deal with, with things like bone spurs. And let's see, I was diagnosed with secondary hyperparathyroidism. They're saying it's causing my kidney stones. What should I do? Um, 
it's a tough question to answer. Um, it, it depends upon, you know, number one, is, is it really the case that your kidneys don't disease this from your secondary hyperparathyroidism? It's hard to know that for sure. Plenty of people will make kidney stones who don't have any parathyroid problems. So it's hard to know for sure that that's the case. It also depends on what the nature of the secondary hyperparathyroidism is. Uh, if you were here earlier and I was talking about secondary hyperparathyroidism, a number of those circumstances are really not disease-related problems, and I wouldn't expect you to develop kidney stones from it. So that's it's. I'm not. I'm not sure really answering your question. Unfortunately, it's a tough. It's a tough one to answer. Okay, a couple more going in. Time-wise, how are we doing? Okay, so we get time for a couple more. Let's see. Why would you need to take calcium after a successful surgery? Um, here's the reason. Uh, there's a couple of reasons, both in the short term and, and potentially in the in the longer term. In the short term, uh, almost everybody has. Um, Almost everybody's calcium levels after successful surgery will run low for a short period of time, usually in the order of one to three weeks. Uh, the reason for that is the following. If you have a classic case with, a, with one parathyroid tumor and three normal parathyroid glands, and let's say you've had the disease for six years. For six years, your normal parathyroid glands have not had to do anything because your calcium has been elevated. They haven't made any hormone. They haven't had to. Um, during that six years of time, you've been making too much parathyroid hormone, which has been telling your skeleton to dissolve itself for all that six years of time. So your skeleton has been losing calcium constantly for six years. As soon as surgery is done and it's successful, your parathyroid hormone levels drop within 30 minutes. And that process instantly stops. And the skeleton, once it finally can, for the first time in six years, will start to actively take calcium out of your bloodstream back into itself. And so your blood levels of calcium lower. Your normal parathyroid glands aren't, at, they're not functional yet. It takes them some time to start producing hormone again. And so for a couple of weeks, your calcium levels are dropping because your skeleton is sucking calcium out of your bloodstream. Your normal parathyroid glands aren't functioning to counteract that yet. And so your calcium levels tend to run low for a couple of weeks. So we supplement everybody for three weeks after surgery. If you have significant bone loss from the disease, um, as I mentioned before, most people will show an improvement in their bone density over the ensuing few years. And providing it with the substrate to help rebuild itself, like calcium, obviously, and other elements, and a multivitamin can help to maximize regrowth of your skeleton. So we often will recommend uh, longer-term calcium supplementation to people who have had a lot of bone loss. Good question. Let's see, where are you located and how can I get an appointment? Do I need a referral? Um, you don't need a referral. Uh, it depends a little bit on your insurance, I guess, but in general, you don't need a referral from your doctor to contact us. Um, we are located in Tampa, um, in a, a neighborhood or a section of Tampa, Florida called Town and Country. Um, it's a little north and west of the airport. So it's convenient for people who are traveling. Uh, to get an appointment, you can go to our website or you can just go to uh, form.parathyroid.com. Uh, that's how you do the intake process or get it, get it started. You enter some basic information and uh, usually within a week, um, one of the surgeons in the practice will contact you for a consultation or you can set up a clinic visit in person. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Um, I think that answers that question. All right, one more. So we we'll snuck one more. That's another good question, important one. What is considered a high calcium level? It's a really important question uh, because um, this is a source of confusion for a lot of your doctors. Um, uh, if you're aged 40 or above, your calcium level should be in the 9 milligram per deciliter range. And so the problem with this is that if you look at most assays for calcium, the normal range will say between, it varies a little bit depending on the assay, but it's usually somewhere between 8.5 and, and often 10.5, 10.5. .5. Um, if you were a little kid and you're building a skeleton, then it's normal to have calcium levels in the 10 range. You need more calcium uh, available to build your skeleton. But if that process has stopped and you're in your 40s, you should not have a calcium level above 10 milligrams per deciliter. So if your calcium levels are 
and your doctor says, hey, this looks great, everything's normal, um, that's because they're looking at what the assay says is the normal range, but for a 40-year-old adult, that's not normal. And most likely, you know, the chances are you have a parathyroid problem that should be sorted out. So that's a great question. And I think that's all the time we have. So um, to everybody who joined, thank you for, for joining. Um, I hope this uh, helped uh, some people out there uh, clarify some of the confusion there is out there about parathyroids and parathyroid disease in general. Um, consider, um, if you do have a parathyroid problem, uh, contacting us through the website, parathyroid.com, for a consultation. If you're out there with a reoperative surgery, you've had an unsuccessful case, again, please consider uh, contacting the center. I'd love to evaluate your case for you. There almost always are, are options for cure. Okay? Until next time, thanks for joining. Bye.